From a distance, one can clearly see the bench line Pleasant View sits upon, left behind from the ancient Lake Bonneville. The concentrated remains of Lake Bonneville make up the Great Salt Lake. This beautiful location would soon be the destination of people from around the world. You know, Brandon, long before the first white settlers came here, the Native Americans used these hot springs for washing and bathing. In a way, this was the beginning of Pleasant View. The hot springs located on the western part of Pleasant View was an important part of the early life of the Native Americans as well as the pioneers. The early settlers used the hot springs much as the Native Americans had. Soon there were people traveling from all around to visit the springs. Reese H. Slater even founded the Utah Hot Springs Resort in the 1880s and proclaimed the water to be the great cure of the West. During its peak, the facility offered visitors swimming and bathing pools, private tubs, a 45-room hotel, a dance hall, a dining room, an adjacent racetrack, and a saloon. In the 1880s and 90s, a steam locomotive made hourly trips to the resort. The resort was later destroyed by fire and never regained its original popularity. Long before the trappers and the pioneers settled in the Pleasant View area, the Indians pitched their tents in what is now Pleasant View. Obviously, there were many, many interesting stories about their encounters as they met with one another. While living in the Pole Patch area, Eliza Parrott Reese, an early settler, recorded this incident. My husband, Charles, and I were getting ready to go down to Sunday school in Pleasant View one Sunday when an Indian appeared at our door. Charles had his face all well lathered up with soap preparatory to shaving. The Indian said, bread, woman, bread. He insistently repeated it, demanding some results. Just then, Charles turned to the Indian showing his lathered face and the Indian disappeared in a hurry. He probably had never seen a face like that before. He knew the white man had diseases and he didn't want to catch that one. A regular procedure was to place a broom across the outside of the door when people left home. This was an indication to the Indians that no one was home. Relics of these first inhabitants can still be found today. One can still stand in the same areas where the Native Americans once stood, enjoy the same southerly view they did. The first white people to come to the area of Pleasant View were the fur trappers, and they observed many of the Indian trails that were here as they passed through. And though the Native Americans settled along the small creeks, uh, they were attracted to the hunting and food for their ponies, in the pole patch area in the nearby hills. The most common tribe to come through was the Ute tribe led by Chief Tobe. They would hunt and fish in the mountains during the summer and then dry fruit in the Pleasant View area during the fall. The arrival of the first white men into northern Utah occurred around 1824 when men from St. Louis were looking for a new area to trap beaver. These mountain men were part of the Ashley Henry Company, also known as the Ashley Fur Brigade. As they made their way into the northern Utah area, they found their competitors, the American Fur Company, who controlled the Upper Missouri River fur trade, were not there. By 1825, however, the beaver had been depleted and the mountain men moved to other areas. These men had created a relationship with the Indian tribes, namely the Shoshone and Utes, and forged the paths that would direct pioneers and settlers to the area that would be known as Pleasant View. Though mountain men had been through this area earlier, the majority of the first white settlers were members of or recent converts to the Mormon faith. These pioneers having traveled across the plains were the first settlers in the area. When they first settled the community, it was generally considered to be the outskirts of civilization bordering the frontier. As white settlers were making their way to the Ogden area, all families north of the Ogden River were encouraged to live in Fars Fort. 
because of Indian troubles that were made worse by the death of Chief Terakee. In 1850, the Utah Territory had been created as an organized, incorporated territory of the United States. And in the spring of 1851, a full 10 years before Abraham Lincoln would take office as president, troubles had subsided and there was peace again amongst the natives and the settlers. Most of the families moved out of Forest Fort, including the William Bailey Lake family, who headed for what was to be known as Pleasant View. There was a main trail running from Ogden through Fars Fort to North Ogden, and then west to California through what is now known as Pleasant View. The William and Sarah Lake home was described as the last place between Ogden and California. Some years later, it was referred to as the Potter's Farm. In the lake home, Mary was born December 15, 1851, becoming the first white child born in what would later be named Pleasant View. In 1858, her father, William Bailey Lake, was assisting settlers back into Utah from Fort Limhi in Salmon, Idaho. The Salmon River Mission was aborted in 1858, partially due to the unrest with the Bannock Indians. William Bailey Lake was part of an advanced group of ten men. As they were riding south along the bank of Bannock Creek, six natives rode up. Two of the natives fired upon them and missed. The company rode up the creek as fast as they could, but the ground was muddy. As they attempted to cross the creek, Bailey Lake's horse mired. As he rose up on the opposite bank, a ball from one of the Indian's guns struck him in the head and two arrows entered his body. He was killed instantly and scalped. Being in danger, the nine remaining men rode to safety. His body was later recovered by four men assisting in the evacuation of the Salmon River missionaries. He was buried in the North Ogden Cemetery. After his death, his wife Sarah remarried. She and her children and new husband, Pleasant Green Taylor, moved to what would later be known as Harrisville. By all written accounts, it appears that the Cragen and Maurer families were the first to settle in Pleasant View. Among the other early settlers were James Maycock, Dr. Ezra Williams, Charles Horatio Reese, Samuel Farron, John Johns, and Edward Davis Wade. Pleasant View's location provided the early settlers more than just a beautiful view. It's located on a mountainous half moon circling to the northwest, which provided protection from the harsh north winds and exposure to the sun. It has exceedingly rich soil and an abundance of water, making it an ideal location for growing all things, particularly fruit, for which Pleasant View has always been justly famous. Pleasant View was considered part of North Ogden for its first 30 years. Later it would be known as the West District, the Hot Springs District, and simply out west. It was also known as Stringtown. It was called Stringtown because People looking at the road said it resembled a piece of string strung along the edge of the mountain out to the hot springs. It was later officially named Pleasant View in 1882 by Wilford Cragen, one of the first white children born in the area. Wilford's parents, Simeon Cragen and Susan Maurer Cragen, had lived in Eagle Township located in Indiana before coming to Utah. The little town was covered in wild walnut trees and green grass and this town was called Pleasant View. These people had embraced the gospel of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and wanted to escape the persecution by beginning the trek to Utah. Wilford remembered his parents talking about the lovely village in Indiana from which they had been forced to leave. Wilford was said to have named the city from its beautiful view and from the city in which his parents had come. Finally, on August 27, 1945, the city of Pleasant View became an incorporated town. In those days, work was the only way to survive. They had to create products and produce with their own hands. They farmed the land and constructed their own houses using whatever materials they could find. The very logs that would provide their protection from the elements had to be found, hand cut, 
and carried to the site where the crude cabin could be built. Lighting was done by candles, which also had to be crafted by hand. Goods that could not be handmade had to be traded or bartered for. Those items were usually done away with because of the high cost, and toys for little children were almost unheard of. Everyone shouldered the load this new settlement brought with it. Land was acquired by purchase, or as Samuel Farron did, by application and survey. In 1848, the United States signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and all land in Utah became part of public domain. The Utah Territorial Assembly governed land ownership in Utah. In 1855, Samuel simply plowed a furrow around his newly acquired land in Pleasant View and moved to Liberty, Eden, then Huntsville. In 1869, Samuel Farron, with his family, left Huntsville to come back to Pleasant View. When he arrived, 14 years later, his land was waiting for him. They put up a tent and stayed there until Christmas when their home was completed. Great preparation and work was involved in building a house. Most of the early homes were built with logs, and they were built alongside the old pioneer roads. More affluent settlers lived in adobe houses. Less fortunate lived in dugouts. When Edmund Ellis brought his family from England, they were in dire poverty. With the help of an ambitious young local named Wilford Cragen, they were able to create a two-room dugout in the hillside. The daughter of Edmund Ellis, Mary Ann, would later marry this young man named Wilford E. Cragen the same man who gave Pleasant View its name. Several years later, Edmund Ellis constructed a more traditional log home. Some of the more fortunate log houses had a lean-to added to the rear for extra storage. The shingles and roofs consisted of sticks and slabs covered with mud. Doors hung on wooden hinges. The flooring consisted of cut logs or dirt. Logs obtained from the huge stand of aspens, known as pole patch, were tall and straight. They were far superior to the cottonwoods the earliest homes had been built with. Although there are many stories about how pole patch got its name, Jerry Wade Cap grew up with this one. When the first people moved into Pleasant View, they needed wood to build their homes. Up on the hill, there were a lot of trees, they would come up and cut the trees down in different areas. As the years progressed from the valley, it started to look like some areas were very full of trees and others were not. People started referring to it as pole patch. That's how pole patch got its name. When Andrew Miller came to America, he brought with him the skill of brick making, which he learned from his father. He persuaded Wilfred E. Cragen to go into a partnership to build bricks using the red clay bank west of Cragen's home. There, they built a mixing plant. Using this local new industry, William Godfrey and his new bride, Lucy Ellen Williams, bought the first bricks and erected the first brick house in Pleasant View. This new method of building a house would change the landscape of Pleasant View and last for generations to come. During the first years, the learning curve was often a big one. Edmund Ellis recalled the following experience with grasshoppers. The crop was planted, came up fine, promising a bounteous harvest, which was never realized, for the flying grasshoppers came in clouds at times darkening the sun and sounding like the roaring of the wind. When descending to the ground, they had every appearance of a heavy snowstorm. They would fly in such numbers that a person was forced to hold something in front of their face for protection. It was constant work just trying to contain the invaders. Samuel Farron recalls the following. We'd see them settle on a grain field at night and in the morning there would be just the stock standing. Thomas Budge, John Maurer and myself, some of the girls used to get out and help fight them. We'd go up on the hill, get a load of sagebrush and pile it and straw up on one end of the field. Then we'd take sticks and go down below and drive the hoppers up into the straw and sagebrush, which was fired, and that way we could burn a lot of them up. This wouldn't work after they were big enough to fly as they'd come back down behind us. 
When the grain was destroyed, we'd plow up the field and plant it to corn and sugar cane, and then we'd have only cornbread and molasses to eat, as our wheat had been destroyed. When we couldn't even get that, we took our sticks and dug out seagull roots. We always carried a stick with us to dig seagull lily bulbs, and I guess I've eaten thousands of them. Even with the food shortages, they survived the first years. But in 1855, that was all about the change. 1855 forced the settlers to struggle for survival. It had already been such a dry summer, not good for crops. Then devastation. A plague of crickets spread throughout the valley. They marched like an army against the settlers. They literally ate the fields bare. Crops were extremely short and the harvest was meager. I try to imagine what life in those early times must have been like for those settlers. They had just moved out of Fars Fort in the Ogden area. And as they started to establish their homes and their fields, they tried to contain the grasshoppers. When they saw these grasshoppers flying through the sky, eating their only food, fields that they had worked so hard to develop, fields that had been so carefully maintained and built by hand, left empty. Nowhere to go, no store to resupply. It must have been extremely hard on morale. Many of the early settlers had large families. I can only imagine what that must have been like. And then, after the crickets, came the hardest winter that even the native settlers had seen. Until now, the settlers were lulled by the previously mild winters they had come to believe that the climate was more temperate than it really was. November of 1855 changed all of that. It began to snow and it was intensely cold. The first snowstorm was four feet deep and caught the settlers off guard. The freezing air flowed through gaps in the doors and the walls. They had no surplus feed and most of the livestock was lost to starvation. Parents and children alike were hungry and cold. Because of the crickets and the mild winter before, people just didn't have extra food storage to rely on. During this extreme winter, they were forced to eat bran, unboiled barley, and oatmeal. In the early spring, they even ate sago roots, dandelion greens, and hides from the animals that had starved. On July the 24th of that summer, the people harvested some of the earliest voluntary grain and had a celebration over this harvest. That food must have been some of the best they had ever eaten. The suffering wasn't over for everyone. On June 14th, 1856, George Humphreys had just arrived in New York. They had sailed from England under the direction of James G. Willey. After traveling by rail to Iowa, they followed the James G. Willey Handcart Company toward Utah. They were forced to eat the raw hide off the wheels of the cart for food after being stranded by an early winter. 66 people died, 15 in one night. And after being rescued by members of the Mormon Church, the George Humphreys family made it to Salt Lake barely alive. Bread was a feast. It was many days before their bodies would accept more than a few mouthfuls. They later moved to Pleasant View, where Mary, the daughter of George Humphreys, would marry Amos Maycock. The settlers built a canal from the Ogden River to the Hot Springs. Even with all these hardships, Earl Cragen says it was finished to the Mason Cutler home, now owned by Colette. Edmund Ellis, a new settler, had been a butcher in his native England. He recalled that at one time it was impossible to find employment closer than Salt Lake City, 45 miles away. He would walk that distance from his home on Sunday afternoon and return on Saturday night. He did this for a period of one year until he found work as a butcher in Ogden. The spring and summer brought forth new crops and a welcome change to that bitter winter and the early settlers again began to flourish. But in 1858, many families, including Henry Maurer and his family, left their homes in what would be known as the Move South. It was at that time that Brigham Young received word that Johnson's army was coming to Utah to punish the Mormons. The people had been misrepresented as being a lawless people by their enemies. 
At that time, President Young sent for the saints and told them to move south, leaving their possessions ready to be set on fire. And during that unrest, many families actually moved to Springville and Provo. Just as things would start to go well, something would come up. This must have made many of the settlers wonder if anything would work out for their benefit. They had to be extremely persistent to even survive these difficult times. After things had settled down pretty well in the state, and the people began to move back into areas that they had previously lived, some stayed, including Henry Maurer, who decided to trade his homestead here in Pleasant View for the farm of James Maycock in the south in Utah County. So they traded, unsight, unseen, for that land back here in Pleasant View, 82-year-old James Maycock and many other families headed back north including John Maurer, and that's the way the Maycocks got here. After the move south, settlers such as John and Sarah Ann Bidwell Maurer made monumental differences in Pleasant View that were felt throughout the country. The Mowers were known to be hospitable to everyone. It was said that no one was ever sent away hungry. Sarah was known to feed the poor and the homeless. They owned a long table and whoever was there at mealtime was fed. Leftovers were kept in a drawer in the table. When hungry, something good could always be found. Though their only child died as an infant, they helped raise nieces and nephews. They also raised Thomas Budge from age three. Sometime in the 1860s, the Wells Fargo stagecoach was established on the John Maurer farm near the hot springs. The Maurer land was said to be about the prettiest in all of Pleasant View and is located approximately 1700 west on Pleasant View Drive. Thomas recalled hearing the horn sound as it would round the hot springs and came into the Maurer station three times a week. Here they would change teams, mend the harnesses, and repair the stagecoach. The travelers were given a tour of the station and farm before they resumed their journey. The coach ran 950 miles and served Dallas, Oregon, and had a branch to Virginia City, Montana. Today, there is a monument in Pleasant View Town Park honoring the good deeds of this pioneer couple. Another form of transportation was on its way that would change the way the entire country would commute and it was headed toward the Pleasant View area. In 1868, the Transcontinental Railroad would influence the development of Weber County and bring welcome employment to the area. Much of the filling and grading and preparation for the train track was done by local settlers, including those of Pleasant View. The work on the Transcontinental Railroad provided work to those in the area from around 1868 to 1869, when the last spike was driven at Promontory Summit, Utah. It is considered one of the greatest technological feats of the 19th century. It literally changed America and took place with the hard work of some settlers from Pleasant View. Farming provided the settlers with basic needs. After the arrival of the railroad, settlers could use the train for transportation of the agricultural surplus the town was beginning to produce. Within 16 years of the arrival of the Transcontinental Railroad, farms were producing heavily. Willard Cragen and farmer T. Sanford each produced more than 1,000 tons of hay. Other farmers also grew hay, grain, potatoes, onions, and sugar beets but Pleasant View has always been famous for its highly flavored mountain-grown fruit. Diana Johns Higley recalls her father, David Johns, producing a variety of fruit and her mother preserving it. We as children remember that it was on the top of the old bee shed that our fruit was put to dry. Mother would stew the blackberries, raspberries, gooseberries, and wild strawberries for just a few moments with not too much water or juice, and then she would pour them onto regular dinner plates to set out on the bee shed to dry in the sun. When dry, mother would carefully put them away, and in the winter, we would re-cook and re-sweeten them with honey. And oh, how nice they were. I can still remember the flavor. The Reese, Jensen, and Cragen families in particular led the way in fruit production, along with Thomas Budge, Eliza Shaw, Farmer Sanford, and others. The area has always produced exceptional apples, apricots, peaches, plums, and cherries. 
there are still many varieties in the local orchards. After purchasing his first swarm of bees from David Johns for $3, Reuben Thomas Reese grew his swarm into 3,500 colonies and he earned the title of Honey King. He became the national president of the Honey Producers Association and he produced more than 100,000 pounds of honey annually. Cattle were not fenced in, but allowed to roam. Samuel S. Farron explains. In those days, the country was open from here clear out to Salt Lake, and all the cows and horses used to roam the country together, as we didn't have any feed for them other than the corn and the fodder they got through the winter. When I got here, I was considered big enough to handle a plow. We used to get up at daylight and strike out over the hills, hook up the team and plow all day, turn the horses back in for night, and then find the cows, bring them back to milk them. Sometimes I've walked as far as Plain City, hunting stock that had wandered away. It was some hard pull, day after day, until we got the crops in. Salt preserved food and played an important part with the settlers of Pleasant View. With the railroad, salt was a successful industry for some men in the area, including the Wades, the Marshalls, the Campbells, and particularly Samuel S. Farron, who each fall and winter would freight salt from the West Warren area near the Great Salt Lake. And when the water would recede in the dry season, crusts of salt would remain on the sides of the inlet, forming chunks about four inches thick. They'd break off those crusts and load them into a double-bedded wagon, about two tons per load. And Samuel S. Farron freighted salt for commercial purposes. He was paid a dollar fifty per ton. Most households got their salt from the same source. They would mill it through a coffee grinder to make table salt, and it was first commercially available for purchase from a mill in Plain City. Access to doctors was limited. Uh, people who became ill were taken care of by relatives and volunteers. Midwives were common, but a doctor was rarely called in except during cases of emergencies, such as that of the Thomas Budge family. The year was 1889. Thomas and Francis Budge had just celebrated the birth of their son, Louis Edwin. A few days later, Francis became seriously ill. Her father, a prominent and successful physician in Ogden, came to her aid. He did everything he could, but on January 1st, 1890, at the age of 24, she passed away, leaving Thomas with four small children the youngest being just three weeks old. Medical technologies would come in the future, but mining was just beginning to explode. Don McGuire discovered lead and silver in the mountain areas to the north of town. He soon began working three main sites, the Santa Marie, the El Dorado, and the King Solomon. McGuire hired Italian workers to blast and dig out the mines. He built a cookhouse and cabins for them. Yeah, this is a, a cabin the miners would use. We've got a rock wall here, we've got uh, the window, and an inscription here that says 1904. It looks like they build up a rock foundation, put some big timber, and the trees are around right here are huge, and then probably just covered it with dirt or whatever else they could find to make their home. It must have given not only Don McGuire, but the entire settlement reason to hope for better things to come when Don first discovered the lead and silver, they had battled through so many difficulties, and here was what they must have thought to be a sign of better things to come. McGuire took samples of the ore to Boston. It enticed wealthy investors to buy mining stock certificates. He returned with the reported $150,000. This financed the building of the famed McGuire Aerial Tram, which was built on the principle of a modern ski lift. Only traces and remnants of fine metals were ever discovered, but the mines created are still present today. Each winter it would get cold enough for the hot springs pond to freeze. All the men and the boys would harvest the ice. Horace Reese gave this account. The hot springs ice pond served as a skater's paradise and also to produce an ice crop to preserve foods and cold drinks. I and others would borrow a horse-drawn blade from Ogden, possibly Lauren Farr's, each winter to insert a deep cut in the ice. Two men with a handsaw would make perpendicular cuts from the edge of the ice to the plow mark. Then these three by three foot chunks would be pried off with a bar. 
The box would be tightly packed in with sawdust. We forget that the settlers experienced the same hot temperatures that we do today. A cold drink must have been a treat craved by young and old on a hot summer day. Herbert and Reuben Thomas Reese both had ice storage houses. They would cut the ice from ponds in the wintertime and then place the ice in these storage houses for use during the summer. Ice was sold to the Hot Springs Resort in the summertime. It was also used to preserve meat and it was used for special occasions such as on the 4th of July when the community gathered to make ice cream. Interesting to know that the ice was also used to preserve the bodies of the dead during the summer until they could be properly buried. During 1874, because there were no convenience stores, James Jensen would sell to the people of Pleasant View goods from his wagon. In 1878, he decided to make his headquarters here in Pleasant View. He brought his family with him. The headquarters included his home and the store. The first school teacher in Pleasant View was Susan Maurer Cragen. She decided to teach her son Wilford at home because he was being picked on and bullied by the students in North Ogden. Soon other children began to attend school at the Cragen home, which from all records appears to be the first school to operate in Pleasant View. In 1865, William Godfrey was the first hired school teacher. He taught in the Cragen cabin. He eventually moved class to his own home, the one he had built using the first bricks in the area. His salary was paid in whatever the parents could afford, whether that was goods, livestock, or produce. An independent school district was organized in 1868, and the school was moved to the old meeting house. Polpatch settlers somewhat formed their own society. Pioneer families in the Polpatch area provided schools for themselves. The first teacher in the Polpatch was Jesse Reed. He taught in his rock home. School was next held in the front room of the James and Annie Rice cabin with Thomas Budge as the teacher. The cabin remains are still visible on 900 West and 4600 North. Although Thomas wasn't a college graduate, he had learned from experience. He was offered $45 per month to teach. He would go on to become a member of the school board of trustees and eventually the superintendent of buildings and grounds for Weber County Schools. Very few books were available, so the teacher would use what knowledge they had. In 1890, a one-room brick school was constructed for Polpatch students. It was heated by a large wood burning stove. It was used until 1894. The first non-sectarian school in Pleasant View was erected in 1890. Made of red brick, it was the first building erected exclusively as a school and held two classrooms. When the pole patch building was closed, the students merged into this school. Wiley Cragen, who taught in the old meeting house and was the first student to graduate from the University of Deseret, was the first teacher and principal. The majority of the original settlers were members of or converts to the Mormon faith. In the early years, people attended the church in North Ogden, the first bishop being Thomas Dunn of North Ogden. Amos Maycock of Pleasant View was serving as bishop of the North Ogden Ward when the Pleasant View Ward was formed in 1882. Edward W. Wade was the first bishop of this new ward. The Hot Springs District Branch Relief Society was established on January 18, 1876, and Mary Jane Hurst Maycock became its first Relief Society president and held that calling for 30 years. The Meeting House was doubled in size shortly thereafter, acquiring the name the Old Meeting House. Cleaning their own house required a broom made of branches of green sage. To clean themselves meant making their own soap. Clothing was made from pieces of a tent, wagon covers, or buckskin. Needles were made from the spine of a prickly pear, and the thread was made from horsehair. Leather for shoes was commonly obtained by killing a sick ox. Hats were made from the longest straws secured from the harvest. Once you were cleaned up, there was no better place to go than to a dance. Dances were one of the most popular events. They took place in the old meeting house under the direction of the bishop. The deacons and the other priesthood holders were the ones that were in charge of taking care of the building. In the events of dances or theater, they had to pound any nails, remove wads of chewing gum, and cut out any splinters on the floor. 
Groups assigned for caring for the building were given free tickets to the event. Nobody was turned away, whether they could afford the ticket or not. The price of admission was often paid with apples, wood, pumpkins, or other goods. A lack of shoes was no barrier, but if one were lucky enough to have a pair, they were carried to the dance and put on upon arrival. If a girl had a calico dress, she was lucky. Some of the more fortunate rode behind their escorts on a horse. A variety of bands were organized, some better than others. Earl Cragen recalled the following. Around 1898, a brass band was organized. There wasn't a single member who had previously blown an instrument. But the leader, Jesse Astell, did a fine job teaching them. Music was provided by local talent. In 1889, a group of 18 members formed the Pleasant View Silver Band, funded by the community. It allowed no brass instruments at all. It was first directed by Chauncey Reese and then Morgan Cragen. They played for rallies and patriotic programs as well as theatrical productions. An important day, instrumentally, was the procurement of an organ. It was paid for in trade for livestock and produce. Initially, it was kept in Wilfred Cragen's two-room cabin, but when a new floor was received in the old meeting house, it was moved there. In the early days, the settlers couldn't just turn on a radio, so they turned to other forms of music. Singing groups were formed by the schools, and, and finally in 1869, a ward choir, which was led by the North Ogden chorister, Frederick Ellis. The choir members began by traveling to North Ogden for practice, and then later alternated sites between North Ogden and Pleasant View. The combined choir was composed of 50 voices, and they performed for special events and celebrations. Later, a local Pleasant View choir, composed of 29 members, was directed by Ezra G. Williams, and a women's choir and children's choir were later formed. Drama and plays were a big part of entertainment. Henry L. Jensen remembered being in the old meeting house and taking part in the play called The Streets of New York. I well remember it was my duty to go up into the little attic and steal a will. I got the will and we made our getaway, only to be brought to justice by Brother Budge. Also in that same play, Helen Maycock came rushing across the stage to put out a fire that was started, and Arthur Budge wasn't quick enough, so they had a terrible spill that wasn't part of the play. Those were the good old days of drama. A debating society was another cause for a community gathering, as was described by Earl Cragen. As long ago as I remember, there was a debating society Problems of the day were debated, and a program was given. After the debate, there were songs, a reading of the question box, prognostication, a paper read by the editor. Articles were written by the people. I think Irene T. Alvord was one of the leaders in that. He was ingenious in getting subjects for debate. He was a comedian and could sing. I think of all those who took part in some way. The meetings were fine and also instructive. Activities helped to improve talent and strengthen the community. In the summer, picnic parties were held when the wild fruit was ripe. Folks would gather together to pick service berries, thimble berries, wild strawberries, and choke cherries. Athletics also played a part in the binding of the community. Horse and foot racing, roping competitions, pulling matches, and Pleasant View's own baseball team were enjoyed by those in the community. After immigrating, the settlers must have wondered how things were going in their native country, as well as with the pioneers with whom they'd immigrated. Many had left family and friends to make the trek here. In 1866, William Godfrey drove a team of oxen to Missouri River and back to haul a load of wire for the first telegraph line in Utah. The most common method of communication was still handwritten letters. That communication was made more convenient when the first post office was created at Tyler, located at Utah Hot Springs. James Jensen was the first postmaster with William M. Wade and June Wade and Ephraim L. Jensen being the first mail carriers. Annie Jensen and Florence Wade later carried the mail to the Jensen Wade store where it was sorted into pigeonholes for each family. This service was provided for 50 cents a year per family Later, mail was taken from North Ogden to the local Cragen Brothers store for distribution. Individual mailboxes wouldn't even be established until 1906. 
Settlers such as Thomas Budge and Brother Alex were able to more easily correspond with those back home, such as their mother who still lived in Scotland. After much work, they had saved enough money to bring her to Utah. These boys were able to find out when their mother would arrive. They walked to Riverdale to greet her as she arrived on the first train to carry passengers to Utah. The first road in Pleasant View is the old Pioneer Trail. You can imagine the mud that would have formed on the trails as people and their horses walked during and after the storms. Locals began improving the roads using hundreds of loads of shell from the Hunts Rock area. Limestone from the Chamberlain Mountain Farm was crushed and used as the foundation for the dirt roads. The Pioneer Road was located just north of the present day Pleasant View Drive and 900 West. 500 West was called Pull Patch Road and was the main thoroughfare for that area. The whole town enjoyed sledding down this road in the wintertime. Must have been a sense of pride for the people of Pleasant View community when it was decided to have a streetcar in Pleasant View. The line was completed in 1892 from Ogden to Pleasant View and the Utah Hot Springs making Pleasant View one of the first rural communities in the state to have streetcar service. It was known as the Ogden and Northwestern. The cost of a round trip from Ogden to Hot Springs was 30 cents. During the first 50 years, settlers battled through plagues and winter storms. They planted the first fields and built the first homes. They traveled the trails and endured the trials to come here to Pleasant View. As Earl B. Cragen said, Our pioneer communities were not free for the taking, as most of us here sometimes suppose. They were bought with sweat and tears and heartache. Their very existence could only have been sustained by faith and determination. So, Brandon, that's the story of the settlement of Pleasant View. I can't wait to see what happens in the next 50 years. the trails during and after storms. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one more time. You know, Brandon, long before any white settlers came, the Indians, I guess. The combined choir was comprom com compromised. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you can just cut a t-shirt that only shows your back, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Huntsville. He eventually, okay. he eventually moved back to Pleasant View 14 years later. <laughs> Music was provided by local talent. They played the <laughs> voiceover number six. Provided by local talent. They played the fill. They played the fiddle. Try it again. Can you get him just a little bit At the side. on the side, just a little? Indy Talbot right there. Thumbs up on the paint job. <laughs> Wouldn't have had an Indian without her. No. Fifth state signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and all the land. Wait, I, wish I can redo this, but I. So after that, can I look at the paper? The whitey man. <laughs> and then da 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 da. Is there a handprint on my back now? <laughs> Your dad slapped me. <laughs> First non sick <clears throat> As the people and their horses walked through during and after the storms. Walked through what? Walked during and after the storms. Not through. Well, you can say walk the trail.
You can imagine the mud on the trails while the pe No, I just gotta say that. I said, you can imagine the mud on the trails as the people and their horses walked through during <laughs> and after storms. That doesn't even make sense. That's it. So I don't have to look at you like I'm talking to you at all. Okay. You know, Brandon, long before the first white settlers came, the Native Americans used these hot, 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 okay. One. <laughs> that looks real. Yeah, I hit that soft spot you were talking about. I can't do it when I need it. Never mind. Okay. Don't show anybody this, okay? Is this still video on every time I'm talking to you?